Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 127. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation Day. One week from now, the Pittsburgh Steelers rookie class will be out on the field for day one of their rookie minicamp, officially announced as May 10th through the 12th yesterday. That's always when Pittsburgh holds their minicamp the second weekend following the draft. So football is really kind of back. Many camps for some teams today. Uh, we are kind of in the swing of things. Oh boy. It's almost football in shorts weather. All right. <laughs> uh, or season. Alex, are you old? Have you ever watched the Indi- I mean, I, I wasn't old enough to even remember when, when this show debuted, but uh, do you remember the, have, did you ever watch the Andy Griffith show? Yes, it was a big, we were a big TV land family and that was on there all the time. The whistling okay. theme song. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. All right. So you, 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 you know who Gomer Pyle is, right? Mm-hmm, I do. Uh, you know, one of the uh, fam- famous uh, catchphrases he had during that show was surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, I think uh, we can kind of. I don't know how that's going to go over with the younger generation, but uh, I, I do forget that a lot of you were raised on TV land. So you saw a lot of this in, in, in reruns and all, but uh, that's probably a good place. Uh, that's probably a good tease to start with on this Friday, right? Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> and that, uh, is that a Mr. Hanky thing too, as no, well? It's kind no, of got the voice I, inflection. I, I know it's not, but it has the voice. that sounds very similar. Yeah. It's probably Mr. Hanky imitating Gomer Pyle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. There's a phrase that, never been said before <laughs> let's move along here and talk about what you're referring to Najee Harris yesterday was deadline day for the Pittsburgh Steelers pair of 2021 first round picks Justin Fields and Najee Harris Fields had his declined no surprise there Najee Harris though had his fifth year option declined as well which to me is a far bigger surprise I admit I was fully expecting the team to pick it up to not really consider it a possibility where they would not but now Najee Harris is entering a contract year he will be a free agent after 2024 look i'm not gonna lie uh i was i was surprised in fact i had a tweet all lined up ready to go with the breaking news as soon as it hit that uh the steelers have exercised the cut the fifth year option on on running back Najee harris that's how confident uh i i i was that they were going to pick this up uh with him uh had the amount been you know because there's different qualification you know there's different uh, 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 level points with that fifth year option based on Pro Bowl and 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 different things and obviously because uh, Najee was never a uh, original ballot Pro Bowler uh, and other factors he was in that lower tier uh, amount level with the fifth year option which obviously was below seven million you know if we were talking about a fifth year option you know had he hit level that 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 were you know, 10 million or, 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 or a little bit more than that. You know, I, I, I certainly would have questioned, well, are they going to do it or are they not going to pick this up and all? Uh, but I was, I was pretty confident because of what Najee has done to this point. Look, here's something that's going to be very rare uh, today from me. Defending a running back. Right. I was going to say, are we going to get our fungible counter going today? Maybe, maybe not as much. Right. Uh, I think that now, look, we don't have intimate information of everything behind closed doors, what the offseason plans are from here on out, what the, what the plans are, you know, next season, you know, the loosely laid out plans and all like that. But uh, I, I got to admit for, for, for the, for what Najee has done up until this point, uh, obviously State has not missed a game, uh, three 1,000-yard seasons, and I'll be the first to tell you 1,000-yard seasons ain't what they used to be, but he's still the only running back in the NFL to do that the last three seasons. Uh, he's sixth overall, I think, in the last three years in uh, in, in, in running backs, total yards from, uh, scrimmage, uh, you know, once again, hasn't missed a game. 
for six point seven nine million dollar fully guaranteed uh, next season, and from where this team sits right now, I I would have picked up his fifth year option, and I'm quite surprised the team didn't. To be honest with you. Let's go through what we know and what's been reported. What we know is they've declined the option. What's been reported is the team has not closed the door on potentially doing a deal after the 2024 season. And reportedly, the reason and the big question is why did they decline it? If it is such a surprise, the reporting primarily seems to be that they want to see how Harris and the offense and the running backs look under new OC Arthur Smith. That seems to be the explanation. I'm not sure how much that passes the smell test in terms of a good explanation, but the reporting is that's the reason why it was declined. They want to see how all the pieces fit under Arthur Smith. Can I say bullshit on this show or no? I think you just did. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm not buying that. I don't think Same. you are either. No, I don't know how you could hire a guy like Smith who's run oriented and be, you know, if you're going to, when you make these hires, you lead with confidence. You don't sit there and say, oh man, I hope this works out. I don't know if we could all, if the pieces are going to fit, if Harris is going to work in this offense, you know, if you're going to hire this OC, you're hiring it because you're confident that Harris will work well, the run game will work well. And even some of the stats that I think Clayton had done, that really swayed me early in the off season that showed even on some more wide zone type concepts that Harris has been successful running those. So I don't think you hire Arthur Smith and then get scared in the corner and say, I hope this works, guys. I don't know if we made the right choice. We'll have to kind of see how the pieces fit. I don't think that's the approach Pittsburgh would take. I hope running backs can run. Yeah, I hope our run-oriented offensive coordinator makes our running backs good. I, I just, yeah. you know, I mean, if that's if that's the reason, it's a pretty crappy one. Yeah, it, it is. To, to me, that's, uh, yeah, I'd be interested in it, uh, to, why, I don't understand it. it who, where is that even coming from within? And I know the reporters are reporting what they supposedly are hearing and all like that. But but that part, like you said, that part of the sniff test uh, doesn't add up here. Uh, and look, once again, uh, people say, Dave, it's not your money. But uh, I mean, we're, we're talking about six point seven nine million dollars here. And we're talking e even that number, which once again, this would have been for two thousand and twenty five would still have uh, Najee Harris outside of the top 10 highest paid running backs in the league by a little bit there. Uh, put, puts him more, what, about 13th, 14th in the, in the, in the league, something r right around in there. And once again, it's not until 2025. Yes, it is fully guaranteed. Yes, a lot could happen between now and, and then. Uh, I just – I, I – I know you got a lot of pushback probably with the phrasing that you used yesterday, but I mean, up until this point, what, what, what more did you want Najee Harris to do? Mm -hmm. And look, I, who was the one highlighting the lack of explosive plays by Najee Harris ahead of him being drafted? It was me. It was the, one of the biggest red flags, but even I, and, and uh, 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 you know, you roll back to last season. He did a pretty damn good job. What do he have? Like eight or nine explosive runs of 20 yards or more last season? Yeah, again, the stat is I think he was second, tied for second in runs of 20 plus yards in the NFL, although his longest run was only 25 yards. So he was breaking that explosive barrier, but not getting much past that. Right. And 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 nobody loves uh double or triple uh uh run game explosive plays more than I do. That's stealing in the NFL. Even so, I think anytime you get a 20 yard run mm -hmm. out of a running back, whether it be 20 yards even, 23 yards, 28 yards, whatever, to me that's stealing. That 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 that's that's huge in an NFL game, I think, to get that out of a running back. And the fact that he had the explosive play rate uh, on on runs last year, I, I thought was impressive uh, for a guy in his third year and all like that. Uh, I'll be told, look, people know the stats. People know uh, what Najee is and Najee isn't at this point. Uh, and no, he's never going to be, you know, uh, even even the running back that just came out last year for the Lions out of Alabama. Yeah, B. John uh, Robinson. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, oh. Gibbs. Um, oh, oh, J. Mark Gibbs. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, he, you know, he he 
He's never going to be that kind of explosive player or whatnot. But I think for what Najee gives you and what you have asked him to do and the set of, set of circumstances at quarterback this team has had uh, since he has been drafted, uh, I think he's done everything, you know, that, that, that I, I think he's exceeded expectations, really. Uh, and that's, you don't put that on a bumper sticker and, and, and use it as a reason to give the guy a fifth year option. But I, I, I think they should have picked up the fifth year option. I don't know if I would say he's exceeded expectations. I think he's basically met expectations and maybe I'm just arguing over the semantics of it all, but, but you've seen improvement in part because the offensive line has improved. I mean, in 21, he ran behind just a terrible offensive line and, and, and still made plays. And the role has changed. He's no longer the workhorse back. There's a timeshare committee with, with him and Jalen Warren, which is good for both of them and good for the team. But yeah, my overall thought is he's done basically everything that you could ask him to do. The numbers are not overwhelmingly gaudy. gaudy. He's not an elite back in the NFL, but he is well-rounded. He's durable. And yeah, people poo-poo the yards, the 1,000-yard streak. Oh, it's only you know 60 yards per game, whatever the math is. But to me, that's not a, a mark of, of the yardage. It's a mark of durability and, and playing in all 17 games to be able to get 1,000 yards. Most guys don't reach that because they get hurt and miss three, four games, and that throws their numbers and their pace uh, off course. And so for Harris to be literally the most durable back in football for a run oriented team. I think it's extremely valuable. He can block, he can catch, he takes great care of himself. So yeah, I, I don't know exactly what more he could have done. He ended last year on a high note overall, this run game ended the year on a high note. Here's my, my overall framing, Dave, had you picked up the option on Najee Harris, you would have had your top two running backs, him and Warren under team control through 2025. And yes, technically you have the franchise tag after this year, but do you really want to use the franchise tag, which is double the cost of what the fifth year option would have been um, to me for a run oriented team to have both your backs under that kind of team control for the next couple of seasons that kind of set it, forget it. You're good. That would have been the no brainer decision. And technically you have Cordell Patterson on a contract too, right? Yeah, I guess through it's a two year deal, correct? So right. that's through 2025. So your entire running back room would have been now Warren, he's what restricted for agent after this year, correct? Right. But but all you need to do is uh assuming he has a season we think he can have, you just throw a second year a second round tender right. on him and and you keep him. So that's where I get the team control aspect of it. Um you would have had Nashi on the option, Warren restricted tender, Patterson truly under contract. And you're good. Now, maybe you do an extension with Harris. There's a whole contract or you know contract situation that would come up if he had a good 2024. But, I mean, you would have been good. No, I mean, your running back room is set. You take it off the board. Like, from a draft standpoint, for agency standpoint, you are good. And I think Pittsburgh should have taken that approach. And look how perfect the hierarchy would have worked out uh, 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 next year on top of it. You know, uh, uh, almost seven million for 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 Nige. Uh Second round tender on on Jalen Warren next year is uh, is projected to be like four point nine uh, million. Uh, what's the average year? Uh, what did uh, Patterson? What what's 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 Patterson's uh, average yearly value on his new deal right now? It is. Uh, three million. So you got a nice. You, you maintain kind of a a respectable hierarchy there in in, in the running back room. We know the cap's going to escalate once again. You would have let's see seven. Uh, I, and I'm talking average yearly value here. Uh, say or, or even just cash payment. Uh, because uh Cordell Patterson's scheduled to earn two point eight million. Next year, let's call Najee seven. That would be nine point eight. And what did I say? The second round tender four point nine. 4. 9. So what does all that add up to? Fourteen point seven. So that's your entire running back room as far as a cash payment next year. I mean, that's not. I wouldn't call that a small number compared no. to some rookie contracts. But for your entire room and the production that you've gotten versus what the cap, the cap will be, yeah, sure, it's it's going to amount to a couple percent uh, of the overall cap, which I think is fine for a run oriented type of team. And I know again there is the fungibility argument, and we've had that conversation before. You hear Mike Tannenbaum talk about, well, just go draft somebody, you know, next year, go take somebody, Jonathan Brooks, you know, type Trey Benson type on day two. 
there's a cost to that too. Using draft capital is resource allocation. And in some ways, I think it's even more costly than paying Najee Harris, the dollars to draft Harris as opposed to a draft pick, which is much more uh, finite than than what you have from the salary cap standpoint. Let's say you have to use a, a, a draft pick on a running back because you don't have anything there or don't have enough there. You can't use that on, on another position of potential need. So to me, there is also a cost when you have to go through the draft um, which can't be ignored, and I think it's ignored too often. If little Johnny has an experienced, uh, fungible running back, and little Johnny, little Johnny can keep experienced, fungible running back and not have to spend draft capital on an inexperienced, fungible running back, what should little Johnny do? <laughs> <laughs> and if two trains are both leaving Chicago, moving in opposite directions. Uh, Look, yeah, I, no, I, I feel real dirty defending running backs here. <laughs> I, 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 I'm i going to have to take a cold shower for several reasons after, after this uh, or, or hot showers. But uh, uh, look, can't. This could all be moot in 24 hours. Could could the teams? Ha- uh, why people are saying you know? And, and this there's an obvious you know follow up to to them not picking up the fifth year option. People are saying, well, they can just sign them to a contract extension between now and the start of the new league year in 2024 and retain him that way. Absolutely. That that is a plausible uh, outcome here. But normally you see, a, you know, normally, I mean, we're only talking, we're not talking about uh, we're talking about a 2025 number here. We're not talking about anything that's going to impact your cap number uh, this year with him. You could have very easily just picked up that fifth year option and then work on an extension past that. Is there that's normally how teams do it? Right. Uh, and 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 tech. You know, in the Steelers' case, though, normally they pick up the fifth year option on a guy and then work out the extension prior to the start of the following season. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, could you have just in the same breath, something that we talked about several times so far this off season, picked up that fifth year option on Najee and work out because look, nobody has been, I mean, he's been vocal about the running back market, right? Uh, even having his fifth year option picked up this off season for, for, for 2025, it still doesn't erase what he's set to earn this year and what his viewpoint of the running back market is. So could you have picked up this fifth year option for 2025, just as a faith of goodwill or whatever you want to call it. And then say, you know what, we're, we're, we'll just go ahead and work out an extension with you uh, this year. Uh, To me, if there were serious plans of trying to sign him to an extension between now and the start of the 2025 new league year in 2025, why, why wouldn't you have? And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to throw it back to you, Alex. I'm I'm, I'm (laughs) going to wait. There's more. I'm I'm going to try to answer my own question here. Mm -hmm. The the only thing I can come up with within my head is that if indeed this team is trying to work, trying to work out an extension with Najee at this point, because of a precedence of not of non quarterback player extensions, they wanted to be able to say that they extended Najee as he went into the final year of his contract, as opposed to him having technically two years left on his deal, which he would have had 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 <laughs> too yeah. many hads in there. Yeah, yeah. Had, had, had. Had, had had they picked up the fifth year option. Does that make sense? Yeah, because Pittsburgh's whole thing is we don't extend players two years out from their deal except for quarterbacks. That is the only thing I can think I can I can put it I can put out there as a possible reason why okay, we're planning on extending him. We don't need we don't need that, you know, 
tech that technically him having the extra year on, on, on the contract with a fifth year option, because that's not going to even mean anything. Us, us bypassing the fifth year option is not even going to mean anything by week one of the 2024 season. Right. But the reporting is for what it's worth. The intention is to maybe do something after 2024. There's been, to my knowledge, no reporting indicating they have a desire to do a long-term deal before 2024. Right. Which then that makes the whole thing moot of of not picking up the fifth year option. Right. And you and I were doing some research last night. I went back to the 2015 class and I didn't go through a fine tooth comb on every option that was declined. It's about a 50-50 rate in terms of exercised and declined when it comes to fifth, uh, uh, fifth round options for first round picks. But I can only find two examples of players who had their fifth year option declined who received an extension in that same offseason before that final year began. There were many that happened after their last season, a prove it type of year, Austin Jackson being a recent relevant example. But in the same offseason, I could only find two. Cesar Ruiz from the Saints and Lakin Tomlinson of the 49ers. Uh, that only two times I could find that. And both came in under what the option amount would have been from an average yearly value long-term perspective. With Ruiz, I think the option amount was 14.1 million. He got a deal worth 11 million per year. Tomlinson was, I think, around nine or 10, and he got about 6 million per year. So the teams didn't put the option on that because if you want to pick up that option, you kind of say that's what the guy's worth right. from an average yearly value standpoint. So they wanted to come in under. And I'll tell you this, Dave, Najee Harris is not taken under 7 million per year on a long term deal. Yeah, let's try to rubber stamp that into a Najee Harris situation like, like you just did. And that, uh, uh, that, are there other examples out there? I'm sure there are. We'll dig for them. We just we did this last night at <laughs> midnight. almost midnight, <laughs> uh, midnight, e uh, midnight Eastern time, where I posed the question: Have there been any instances where a player has not had their fifth year option exercised and then signed an extension? Now, both times with with both those uh, offensive linemen, that was within within the same off season that the fifth year option decision was not exercised, right? Right. That's what, that's the conversation. Could they still do an extension with Harris this off season? And they just decided to not do the option just because they're focused on the extension. The history says it's very rare. Right. And I would imagine that however long we build this list out of instances with that, that, that match that, that a lot of times the player is going to come in with an average yearly value on the new contract lower than the fifth year option amount he was bypassed on. You think? It would seem so. In those cases, it seemed like they liked the player, the, the value was just a touch too high. And so they wanted to try to do something under that. In both cases, they did. All right. So if we were to think that maybe that might be the course of action with the Steelers and Najee Harris, then we're looking at them trying to get him to agree to a contract with an average yearly value amount less than his fifth year option amount, which was six point what seven nine, right? Right, which I have a hard time believing Najee would go for that. I feel the same way because that would look, this guy is pro you have to think he's angling to at least get into top ten, right? Right, which would require what at least seven, seven million, at least seven million. And if it was right at seven million, he'd be tied along with uh, uh, Aaron Jones and 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 James Conner right now. And frankly, at, he's at probably 10. angling for more because you just saw some running backs get paid decent amount, Barkley, et cetera, this offseason. Right, right. So unless he's willing to take less at yeah, I just I don't see how you get it done. I really don't. I think I think he laughs in their face. Agreed. So my expectation now is that he will play out this year on a contract year for him, and they will look at how things you know where things are at after twenty twenty four, and go from there. He will go into you know potential free agency. Now look, uh, I there's nothing says they can't work out an extension with him. All right, uh, uh, between. Any time beginning right now and all the way up until the start of the new league year in 2025. I will tell you this, though. 
If they are able to do that, I will be just as surprised at that that happened as I really was them not picking up the fifth year option. You know, and I know a lot of people will listen and say, man, you guys are crazy. There's no way I would have picked up that fifth year option. Okay. That, 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 that's, that's, that, that's sure. I, I, I could, could you entertain arguments from the masses of why the team shouldn't have picked up the fifth year option? I mean, you can, I mean, you can talk about just never paying running backs and the idea of just letting these guys go as soon as they get any sort of expensive and and moving on. I mean, I agree that running back, if you were ranking the positions on offense, running back is the quote unquote least valuable. It's less valuable than a left tackle or your quarterback or a number one type of receiver. So, and you could also say that, listen, Omar Khan did not draft Najee Harris and we're seeing Omar Khan undoing some of the recent picks that Kevin Colbert made talking about the 2022 class that looks a lot different. That looks much more, much emptier than where it was when Colbert left, obviously. Um, you talk about the 2021 class and some of the changes and differences there. There may be a different ph- uh, philosophy, a new age approach of we're not going to pay running backs or we'll only pay a running back when it's so obvious that we have to go pay that that guy. In other words, Omar Khan is part of uh, team running backs are fungible, right? Exactly. You might be waving that flag right now. All right. Um, look. Well, here, here's another thing, and I wrote about this last night as well, too. Uh, do we have anything else to discuss about the actual decision and 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 you know that sort of thing? Because I, well, I mean, I, I I've got an add on here because I kind of wonder now. It, what are you thinking if you're Najee Harris right now? Yeah, I, I I wonder a bit. In some ways, you're probably, as you kind of mentioned before this news came in, you're probably pissed off because the team says in some sense you're not that valuable. But also, if you're Najee, you kind of sit there and say, if I have a great year, I can go cash in on a long-term deal right now. And so I think running backs would like to get paid sooner than later. Older they get, the more wear and tear they have, the higher risk of injuries, and you know the harder it is to secure that long-term deal. So to him, there's probably an upside of him. I can go get that long-term deal a year quicker than what I thought I might. Yeah, but okay. Uh, what about, sure, I, I I get that. Look, he now at this point with him, and assuming he does not sign an extension uh, between now and week one of the regular season, uh, it, it it's a contract year for him, and he's got uh, all the ins- even more incentive in the world to stay healthy on the field. But, it, you know, it's not been a problem with him yet, knock on wood. Uh, but what is, I, I wonder what is going to be his course of action the remainder of summer, starting with OTAs. You know, will he show up for OTAs? Now, look, you cannot point your finger at him if he doesn't, because those are volunteered, right? Uh uh, although it will be taken as, and we'll write a, you know, we'll write about. Don't look like Najee Harris is that volunteered, you know, organized team activities uh, and, and and all. But if you are him, do you take all the precautions in the world between now and week one of the season to make sure that you enter week one of the season as healthy as you possibly can? Would not blame him one bit if he did. So I think the first line in the sand are the voluntary OTAs. The bigger one is the mandatory minicamp, which will happen in June, because that is mandatory. You can't be fined if you do not attend it. And then he'll, of course he'll, we'll he'll see, show he'll show up for that. I think so. I think so. But still, in terms of lines in the sand, things to look at. Uh, and then of course training camp, he'll be there because you could find what thirty grand a day if you don't. And those don't you can't rescind those as the team. But the question is, will it be, I think you floated a, a potential hold in. Will he just not do much in training camp? Well, that, will that hamstring just get a little bit tight, <laughs> uh, uh, dur- during training camp and, and, and most no, that guy ain't going to want to play in no preseason game. Is he? <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Not, not to be fair. I'm going to double check this as we talk about it, but I think Pittsburgh was very careful with him last sure. year. I don't think he was tackled once in training camp last season, just okay. because they were protecting him. Uh, he was participating, but he wasn't going through the live tackling drills. If memory serves. And I imagine regardless of the option, that would have been the team's plan this year. Sure. I, I imagine even, at, even if they were to turn around 24 within the next 24 hours and sign him to a contract extension, they're going to take it easy on him. 
Right, right, as they should. Because remember, what, two camps ago, he had gotten hurt that first day of pads, right. and that dogged him throughout the first half of the season. I think Pittsburgh decided that he, didn't, he doesn't have to prove anything more in camp. We know who, the, who he is and how he runs and his value to the team. So, yeah, I'm checking my stats here. I said he was rarely tackled in camp. Uh, he was, even in full contact practices, he was always kind of getting thud tackled. Um, mostly seven shots or goal line. He'd be a you know, full participant in, in the live tackling session. So they were very careful with his usage last year, as they should be. So in other words, uh, even if he holds in, would we, will we even know it? it was, <laughs> yeah, minorly, probably would not impact things much besides the storyline of the hold in would obviously be the story. But but you do admit, though, that, that it, it will be interesting to watch his summer course of action. Of course, yeah. I think anytime a situation like this arises, uh, Harris, in, in not only just the, the course of action, but what he has to say when he, when and if he speaks to the media, uh, he's someone who can certainly be vocal and speak his mind, and I support that. I don't have any issue with that, but certainly will be circling that first media quote from Najee Harris. How how do you view his relationship with the media and 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 trusting of the media up until <laughs> this point right now? Strained to say the least. Now, last year was frustrating season overall. I think Najee has had fun with the media. I think when times are good, things are good. When times are bad, you know, you can tell times are bad. I think he certainly wears his his emotions on his sleeve, which again, not a critique, just just how his personality is. And I think he's had some really fun interviews and some fun quotes and fun moments. I think he's pretty honest, which I really re- appreciate and respect. But certainly there are times where you can tell he does not want to speak with the media. The Buffalo Bills just signed Chase Claypool. You can hey. scratch Chase Claypool off your free agent. <laughs> Another receiver. Pittsburgh missed out on. That's a, that's a joke there. Uh, DJ <laughs> Chark did sign, uh, by the way, with the Chargers. So I was really hoping maybe it would come to Pittsburgh. So one year contract for Chase Claypool. Well, good luck to him. Hope he does well. Uh, he won't have to go to the CFL. You know, the CFL was claiming his right, so he can avoid that for now. Uh, okay. Uh, it will be interesting to watch uh, any anything to do with Najee Harris and the media moving forward. Those are going to be, remember last year, uh, right when they reported to training camp, that wasn't too long after the running back uh, Zoom, you know, chat, uh, Zoom calls where they were all getting together, discussing the market Mm -hmm. and and, and stuff like that. And it was a little bit of a, I guess, kind of awkward media scrum there to, to start with. And I, I just, I wonder how those are going to go. And if he, you know, if he shows up at OTAs, then you would think that would probably be the next instance of that, right? If he speaks to the media, I'm not sure what uh, obligations players have to speak to the media during that time. So we'll just have to to wait and see when he does get in front of a mic the next time. Well, if he does it, then he's going to be termed by half the fan base of being a, a butt about it, right? Yeah, but I'm just saying in terms of there's no guarantee he speaks if he does report to OTAs. I don't know. I don't believe there's any sort of obligation that you have right. to speak to the media during that time. So right. I just I just say that to say I don't know when we're going to hear from Najee again. All right. Uh... But doesn't it make sense? Because, okay, it, just from his standpoint, let's say they picked up the fifth year option. There was no long term deal done and his next contract would not come until after the 2025 season. He would have been, what, 28 by then? Because he came out as an older running back, he was one of the, he was the rare senior running back. He stayed the extra year at Alabama because he was behind all those guys and never wasn't starting as a freshman the way that some running backs do. So, if you're you know going to be 27 and get that long term deal as opposed to 28 or whatever it is, 29 years old, that that's a big difference in terms of getting a long term right. deal. So again, in some sense, there is a an opportunity for Harris to get that contract sooner, which is what all these running backs are angling for. Well, look, well, and, and what have I said all along when it comes to him? My, my what, what I, and look, once again, I don't know what their plan is past yesterday's date as far as their cash spend. I tell you right now, their cash spending is still low uh, mm-hmm. this first year at the CBA. Uh, they've obviously got plenty of cap work room to work with uh, uh, this year. Right now, they've got plenty of, uh, 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 enough next year. Obviously, that can change uh, in, 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 a, in a heartbeat. Uh, what I kind of thought would be the plan or what they should should be the plan is try to get them the quote unquote because of his age, because of the wear and tear that he's had already, because he's hollering about the running back market. Go ahead and get him paid this offseason. 
uh, you have you have you have the room and the cash spending to do it. You have the cap room where where if you got a deal done, you're probably not you're not going to raise what what is already is cap number for 2024 significantly. Go ahead and get him locked up on a three you know, on on a uh, deal two more years on top of this year. Uh, get the quote unquote meter running on him. Get him fat and happy with not physically, but uh, uh, fat and happy with his bank account and 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 sp- <laughs> internal feeling and all like that there, and just get that behind you. And, and obviously, I would not expect the uh, such a deal to have a uh, guarantee, uh, full guarantee, past the first year which is fine. I, I, I think you could have still gotten something done with him uh, that way, but that would to, to me ha, uh, have been the, 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 the perfect scenario when it comes to him co- contractually this off season. And, and maybe, maybe they'll do that. Maybe, maybe, maybe once again, maybe we'll be put, putting the crow in our mouth here uh, between now and, and, and week one of the season, but it just, it, 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 it just does not feel like it's going to go down that path. It doesn't. I think that path would have made sense. I think the idea of you just play the five years, you pick up the option, you never sign them to a long-term deal and just let them play out through 2025. You put them on the scrap heap and move on also would have made sense for, again, an older running back when he came out. Pittsburgh seems to be taking a potential middle path, which to me makes the least amount of sense of the three options. And look, you know, people will say, well, he's not been the perfect team leader and yada, yada. You know, I, Najee's a unique, unique kind of guy. You know, I, I think he's more lead by example than anything. He's not the raw, raw, you know, uh, 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 kind of guy, uh, when, when it comes to that. So, uh, I, I just, and look, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm once again, I'm going to need a hot shower here because I'm defending running back first 45 minutes of this show. But, uh, I, I personally think and we'll see how it plays out. I think they should have picked up. I was expecting them to pick up the fifth year option. I think they should have picked up the fifth year option. And I think they, the, the goal should have been work out an extension with him between now and week one of the, uh, of the 2024 regular season. Will they, will they ultimately get there? I, you know, I, I kind of find it hard to envision stranger things have happened. And oh, uh, if they do, I would expect the extension to be, have a, have an average yearly value of seven million or more to 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 get that done. And I, I, the stat's been floating out there. I can't take credit for it, although it's pretty obvious. But the last Pittsburgh Steelers physical first round draft pick that had their option picked up was T.J. Watt in 2017. Now Minka had his picked up as he was acquired from uh, Miami, so that one can count in a sense. But the track record in terms of you know often you can judge the success or failure on was it a good pick or not based on whether or not that fifth year option was exercised. And in Pittsburgh's recent history, there's been a lot of declines on those fifth year options. Right. Right. Uh, I don't, I ain't going to say I told you so, but I told you so. I mean, you don't, maybe, maybe they'll get away from drafting running backs in the first round now. It would seem so under Omar Khan. If they're not going to pay a guy $7 million, I don't think they're going to have the, the interest in drafting the position in the first round. But to me, even a second or third round pick is not nothing in terms of cost. Now, if you have an undrafted guy, a Jalen Warren that comes in, that's a different story in terms of what the cost of capital is and of the resources. But a second or third round pick still costs a lot. Dave, just as a quick look on the horizon, don't want to spend too much time on this, but you know how this year's free agency was very boring in the sense of Pittsburgh's own free agents. So are they going to re-sign Armand Watts? Are they going to re-sign Mason Rudolph? It wasn't exactly the most notable internal free agency class. Next year is going to be a much different story with Najee, the quarterbacks in Wilson in fields, James Daniels. We'll see what happens with Pat Frymuth. Does an extension get done this off season? Certainly possible, but if not, he'll be a free agent as well. I mean, there's going to be some notable names Cam Hayward. I mean, there are some notable names who are going to be due next year. And then I roll back to uh, thinking, where are they going to spend their cash this off season? You know, or, or, or this season, this season in general, because yeah, you're right. If you look at 2025 uh, overall and you look at 
Now, look, a lot of these guys on this list aren't even going to make the 53-man roster, but... Uh, yeah, just, just choose the most notable names. Who are the biggest names that are pending for agents or contracts as of today are set to expire after 2024? Let, let's let's talk about guys that, that have a, chan- a, a legitimate chance of making the 53-man roster. Okay. Uh, uh, because a lot of these guys, people say, well, that's not significant. Let's, let's just build the list that way. Isaiah Loudermilk, and I'm, I'm, I'm just doing this the way I sorted here. Dan okay. Moore, Dan Moore, uh, Russell Wilson. You want to put Michael Pruitt on there? I mean, no, I wouldn't count Pruitt. All, right. no. uh, all three of your quarterbacks, Kyle Allen, Russell <laughs> Wilson, Justin Fields, uh, I think they work out and I think they get an extension done with Pat Fryermuth later this summer. But until they do, Pat Fryermuth's on the list. Demonte Casey, uh, Najee Harris, Elandon Roberts, Nate Herbig, Dante Jackson, who you just traded for this offseason, James Daniels, Cameron Hayward, uh, Jalen Warren will be restricted. Okay, that that that's the end of your unrestricted types end at Jalen Warren. I mean, end at Cameron Hayward. Right. That is a notable list to say the least. Now, do we expect this team to sign Pat Farmer to an extension this off season? I'm still a little less certain than you are, but if there is a guy, it sounds like it'll be him. All right. Uh, Cameron Hayward. I, I still think because not only because, if they get something done, it'll be a two year, probably a two year extension with him. No new money in, 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 in year one. And it'd be kind of like, uh, Hey, we, a we needed to do this to lower your cap number this year. And B, uh, we're going to take it year by year with you past this year. Right. Right. That, that still makes sense. Still could happen. But. So, so technically by we, uh, what I'm saying, I guess is by week one of the, 2024 uh, uh, season that I, I'm not expecting Firemuth and, and Hayward to be on this list. Right. But right now they are. And even if you remove them, there are still some heavy A list type of names, some starters, some key names, and players that right. populate that list. So just something to think about. Look, are they going to sign Dan Moore Jr. to, to, to an extension this offseason? No. Right. They are, they gonna, are they going to sign Louder Milk? No. Uh, are they going to sign Kyle Allen? No. Uh, Landon Roberts? Probably not, right? Probably not. Nate Herbig? <laughs> they will not. Dante Jackson? They will not. James Daniels? Jerry Dulac said he didn't think Daniels would be re-signed this year or after next. I think that's just maybe speculation from him, but he didn't feel like that was coming this off season. All right. Uh, I think of all the, uh, of, of other guys on the list, not named Firemuth and, 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 and Hayward. I think there's a decent, I, I still think, I think so more than you. I think there's a decent chance. Maybe they find some middle ground with Justin Fields. They could. Again, I just want to see how it works from Fields perspective, but that is also possible. Yeah. So again, we'll have to see these things are fluid and change and you never know how a season will go. But my, my point is compared to this past off season, we're exiting in terms of the biggest free agent names were Miles Killebrew and Mason Rudolph, Armand Watts compared to this upcoming class. It's going to be night and day. What message, if any, does this send to the everybody else on the team? If a guy like Najee Harris can't get a, measly under seven million dollar fifth year option picked up i don't know if it sends a particular message or there should be an interpretation it, it's business ultimately sure so uh, nausea again is going to be i think maybe pretty pissed about it and maybe an angry nausea can be a good thing not that i think he needed more motivation i think he's a very self-motivated kind of man um i i don't know i don't have a good sense of sending a particular message all right, you know, along the same lines of Najee throughout this offseason, we wondered, okay, if they pick up, if they pick up the fifth year option on Najee, maybe, maybe not, they uh, 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 get get a long term deal done with them this offseason. What, you know, we've talked about Jalen Warren as well too. Uh, it, 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 could he become a candidate at some point during the offseason for some sort of uh, uh, mid priced extension? 
there's no way they're extending him this offseason, right? At this point now? No, not. I mean, that'd be a, another slap in the face to Najee. And maybe, maybe they do it next year instead of having to put the tender on him. They can work out a two, three year deal. Maybe lower right. that cap charge a bit, but not this offseason. No right, way. right. Not, not, not now. Definitely not now. It was already questionable whether or not they would do something with him this offseason before the Najee fifth year option decision. But now, now that it's been made, and especially if they don't get a new deal done with Najee between now and week one, there's no way in hell they're giving uh, Jalen Warren an extension this offseason. Unless Warren was just going to play for stupid peanuts, just like a th- two year five and a half million dollar extension, three years, seven million. Some, but I mean, he'd be, be ridiculous for him to take that kind of uh, right, offer. Right, right, right. All right. So that is the story on Najee Harris. Let's um transition. Speaking of Jalen Warren to not his contract situation, but comments he made during this past weekend's not just football podcast that was dominating the entire NFL conversation yesterday, yesterday, not just in Pittsburgh, but I think nationally, when Warren had made a comment that apparently Nanny Smith floated the idea of using Justin Fields as a kick returner. Now, was he serious? Was he joking? That's for all of us to discuss, decide, and ultimately watch for. But Dave, what's your reaction to those comments? I I don't, A, I don't know how much tongue-in-cheek is involved in there. Um, I don't know. It, it, it's hard to get the overall context of it. I'll tell you this, it, it, it what ran through my head, but that would be fun to watch maybe a couple of times <laughs> <laughs> to have, to have uh, Cordell Patterson and, 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 and Justin Fields, the two, because of the new rules and having to have the two guys, right. the, the two deep guys back there. And we even kind of talked one, once this team signed Patterson and, 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 and kind of took a deeper look at the rules was, all right, if Patterson's on one side, do you just, you know, uh, have a concerted effort to, 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 to kick away from him. Right. Uh, sure. how much, how much game, you know, uh, how, where does the strategy and gamemanship shift in, in, in that nature? Now, if you have a guy like, uh, Justin Fields, if, you know, you, you do such a thing, I mean, that, that's, that's obviously a guy that's electric with the football in his, uh, uh, hands running forward as well, too. Now, then you get into the, do you really want your backup quarterback out there taking unnecessary hits on, 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 on special teams? Uh, a, do I think we will see it at all in 2024? I'm not going to rule it out. Do I think it's going to be in every kickoff occurrence? No. Uh, is there some in, in between? Look, for it to come out, Jada Ward to me is a pretty, what you see is what you get. He don't make stuff up. He's not in it for audio clicks, if you will, or, or that sure. kind of thing. Uh, something was said that had them guys kind of thinking that maybe this would be a, 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 a slight possibility. Yeah. It doesn't sound like it was a total joke the way that Danny Smith was presenting it, but it is Danny Smith does not have sole authority to decide who goes back there for kicks. Mike Tomlin will have some control over whether or not he wants his quarterback to do that. So, I mean, I, it's just hard for me to think that's going to happen. I mean, God forbid your quarterback gets hurt mid game. You know, Justin Fields gets hurt on, on, a, on a kick return. Uh, I, I think there's just a risk involved with that sure. where they can go find somebody else. I mean, it, it'd be exciting. It'd be fun. And does he maybe field something in training camp? I mean, that'd be a heck of a story if they actually just, you know, in warm ups they have the, um, uh, the, the, uh, not the drugs machine, whatever the machine is that'll shoot the, the football up there. Uh, maybe they mess around with it. But I just have a hard time believing it would actually be used. I mean, maybe in some sort of like do or die situation where it's last kick return is three seconds left and you're down. They just scored. The opponent just scored or take the lead. Maybe you would throw him back there, uh, depending on how many reps he would occasionally get before beforehand. But it just it, it feels like more offseason fodder than regular season reality. Unique situations only in the regular season. Yeah, but even then, I mean, you would have to you'd have to rep it beforehand. You can't just throw him out there just randomly, you know, in his first career, first time fielding a kick can't be with in a game, I wouldn't think. So, again, I'd be very surprised. I'm just trying to think about you know, quarterbacks that would be used in different ways. Is that maybe never really happened before? Um, I mean, there's been some of the conversion types, the Joe Webbs, et cetera. I remember... Um, not that he was ever used in a game because he didn't make the team, but Gerard Johnson, who's now the what OC 
in or the quarterbacks coach, whatever his title is in, in Houston, he was used on, on kick coverage just as a not actually running down kicks, but in practice, they put on the little beanies, the little caps, and he would be out there. It was like R1 as one of the outside contained guys just to be a body out there. That has happened occasionally. That won't happen with Fields. So, again, I think it's probably more of a media story than it is going to be reality, but we'll we'll keep an eye on it for training camp. Yeah, look, uh, do I think this is going to, to, to be something like kickoff team, get out there, and, or kickoff return team, get out there, and Justin Fields is, is one that's always running out there? No. Uh, but what if I were to put the over and under of Justin Fields being on a kickoff return team in 2024 at 1.5? I'm still going to take the under. Again, I guess like you, you can't totally rule it out until you get an idea of how they want to use him. But I, I just that feels like a big stretch. I would I would if, if you gave me the one. All right. What if I gave you point five? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. In other words, I'm, all you need is one instance one. of it happening. Will you I'm, still, I'm taking the under. I'm saying You're taking the under? I'll, I'll take the over. I, okay. I, I, I think that I think just by it randomly getting joked about mentioned by Danny Smith slash Jalen Warren gives it a chance of being at least at least one or two times. Do you think Fields would want to do that? I don't I don't think he would have a problem with it. I really but then you get into the whole typecast. Oh, you're no longer a quarterback. You're this gadget guy. And it's probably a rejection. Not, of, not, hey, if it, a not if you do it twice a year or three times a year. I don't think you are. Now, if you're back there every time, maybe. But I mean, he's he's that guy's electric when, when some of these runs you roll back with. Sure. I mean, that, that guy, that guy can that guy can move, man. He can get down the field. I mean, why? In certain situations, why wouldn't you maybe roll him and 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 Cordell Patterson out there late in the game? Man, we need a big return uh, 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 type situation, you know? Yeah, I just from his standpoint of I'm not a kick returner. I'm here to play quarterback. Don't put me out there to run to run back a kick. I'm here to I'm here to play quarterback to get paid as a quarterback to be viewed as a quarterback. I I don't. He comes off as a great kid, man. The more you watch sure. him, I mean, he, yeah. he really comes off as a great kid. I, I don't think he'd have, at least I don't, you know, I don't know him, but I don't view him as a, well, he, I'm a quarterback, man. Why are you throwing me out there? I think he'd like an opportunity to maybe make okay. a play that way. But that's, yeah, I, 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 I don't, don't know. You can bet he'll be asked about it now at some point between now and week one of the season. For sure. And Mike Tomlin will. And. We don't get to hear from Danny Smith too often, but whenever we do hear from Danny Smith, which may happen in camp or during OTAs, uh, he will surely be asked. Right. All right. Uh, what else do we have here, Dave? Uh, you, you have some stuff on DK Metcalf. You've kind of gone down a DK Metcalf rabbit hole with the whole receiver talk, which we'll continue to discuss and get some new information on on that here as well. But what, what are your takeaways in, in regards to anything DK Metcalf related? I am a 56 year old man that got uh, peer pressured into <laughs> <laughs> cyber bullying works, guys. That's the takeaway here. Uh, into kind of addressing this. Uh, let, let me start off with saying that, you know, l l what do you think about what all Omar Khan has said to this point? And I, let before we even get there, why don't we roll back into what Bryant McFadden tweeted and what Bryant McFadden has uh, since kind of uh, walked back on and what Omar Khan has said in the last couple of days in, in, in interviews. Let's start there. Sure. OK, with BMAC on Monday, whenever it was, he had the tweet that came out. Omar Khan's cooking. They're very close to acquiring, adding an explosive playmaker. And it was not Patrick Peterson. And that's all McFadden was really saying. And since then, he has completely basically walked that back. He's now deleted the tweet that initially said they were going to acquire explosive playmaker or very close to doing so and went on 93.7 The Fan and said it's a no, no Steelers connection, told him this. It was a third, fourth party, a friend who works in the NFL or has conversations in the NFL. He didn't know the name. He wouldn't say it was a receiver. He wouldn't say it was a guy on a roster. Essentially, the, the report, the tweet had no credibility. Now, I don't think BMAC made it up. I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he heard something, got excited, didn't realize how much Steeler fans would run with the idea, how much of a story it would be, would become, 
he had fun with it initially whenever it's just kind of the, oh, you're, what do you got for us, Mac? Tell us. And then he realized, okay, this thing doesn't happen, how quickly that warm can turn. So I think he just got the full experience of what playing insider is like. I think he just made a mistake and and that's fine but he certainly i think did not realize where that tweet would go all right no more cons since then in a couple of interviews that he's done jim rome pat mcafee yeah essentially saying that nothing is close nothing is imminent he didn't know where that report was coming from but he said conversations continue certainly seemed open to exploring adding a receiver at some point somehow all right, go ahead and add into that what uh, what uh, John Lynch said on McAfee from, from the 49ers. Sure. Lynch said they're moving on in terms of receiver talks. He admitted there were conversations that took place during the draft about his receivers and potential moves, but said we're past that. We're, we're after the draft. We're now focused on building the best roster possible and going to win a Super Bowl. So, again, you can never say never. To use the Tomlin phrase, never say never, but probably never in terms of acquiring an Ayuk or a Samuel this offseason. All right. Uh, as a, I want you to wear, I want you to put two hats on here. As an analyst, do you think uh, the Steelers should add an outside, you know, a, a, a playmaker on the outside at wide receiver moving forward into the rest of this offseason? And then. 12-year-old fanboy Alex, do you want the team to add a significant player <laughs> uh, a playmaker uh, at, at wide receiver moving forward? Yes, to both. I wrote about the need to, to not be finished at receiver right after the draft ended. Although at this point, I am kind of just tired of the speculation. I think they will add some someone at some point. I don't know who. I don't know how. They should. They need to. But at this point, we've spent two months speculating about it. And at this point, I'm just saying, okay, just let me know when it happens. I don't want to speculate. I, I'll, oh. I'll, I know you're going to speculate. We'll indulge that. But I'm just personally, I'm just kind of like, okay, I get it. They could do something. I'll wait to see what the move actually becomes. All right. 56 year old blogger in mom's basement thinks the Steelers should do it. And 12 year old Steelers book bag carrying uh, Dave thinks, uh, hopes they, uh, they do it as well too. Uh, we both admit that it looks like the list of possible players to fit that criteria is has, has shrank uh, tremendously. And then you just mentioned DJ uh, Chark signing with uh, uh, the uh, the Chargers. It sounds like Tyler Boyd's going to end up somewhere other than Pittsburgh uh, based on his, I mean, the Titans sound like a logical place with him, with his former head coach being, or f- former OC being over there and all like that. It just, there doesn't really ever seem that there's been much really with the Steelers and Tyler Boyd. Uh, it, it, what are your thoughts on Ayuk and, and, and Debo Samuel at, 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 at this point? I'll assume that's a dead until told otherwise. All right. The list now, I mean, is there a list? I mean, really, really uh, at, at this point. Uh, several people and this kind of stems from one of those specular spec spec rumor reports, uh, uh, last week, you know, how much sni- have indeed the Steelers been sniffing around maybe DK Metcalf and the Seahawks. Um, how, how logical is that? I, I, a lot of people have been asking me about it. So, you know, I got some emails on it. So I went down the rabbit hole to look at, uh, the Seahawks. Uh, specifically at their cap situation and maybe the the, the, the plausibility of them uh, trading DK Metcalf. And it took a lot of, re- I, I did enough research that I was, I was enough invested in it that I had to write a post about it. So I did that the other night. Um, here's what I found. They are right up against the cap right now. And look, I do not intimately follow the Seattle Seahawks salary cap situation. But as far as I can tell, it's it's going to be kind of touch and go with them. The rest of the offseason, I think their GM, John Schneider, was on a radio show, on his radio show yesterday, yesterday meaning Thursday, and he admitted as such that we're right up against it. Basically, this is going to kind of be a fluid situation. Look, they've got less than $3 million in salary cap uh, space as far as I can tell right now, and they still have to sign – their 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 draft class 
And they don't even have technically enough room to do that right now. Now, in that same interview, John Schneider said that, you know, there's things that are going to happen automatically. He kind of hinted at, you know, maybe some restructures. But if you look at uh, the uh, the list of players on over the cap and the true restructure uh, 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 the contract restructure candidates, it's not a long list. And in fact, DK Metcalf is one of the guys that they could potentially go to and free up a little bit of salary cap space with a restructure. And then obviously if they do that, he's not going anywhere. Uh, right, like Tyler Lockett that happened with Lockett, correct? Right. Earlier in the offseason, they've reached you. Uh, I know a lot of people have talked about Tyler Lockett uh, as a potential guy they could trade, but they just re- they just restructured his deal. And it seems highly unlikely that you're going to do that, push the push the cat, the the, 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 the you know, cap kicking down the road. And then you turn around and trade a guy. Right. right because explain that, because you would get hit with all that dead money this year and you'd just be wrecking yourself, especially for a team that is struggling cap wise. Right. If you're going to trade him and, and, and knew that there was a potential of doing that versus kicking the cat, you know, restructuring and, and creating, it's not often you see teams restructure a guy, push out cap money and then turn around and trade them. Right. Cause all that just gets re-accelerated back to you. So it just defeats the purpose of the restructure. Especially if you do it before June 1st. You know, because it would it would have made logical to to not restructure his deal, trade him before the draft, even so you get capital for 2024 draft. It just at this point, when you look at Tyler Lockett, it just seems highly, uh, m m m m you know, highly unlikely that uh, they'll deal Tyler Lockett at this point. Now, uh, obviously, until they no, maybe they got DK Metcalf on the list of guys that they're going to restructure and restructure very soon. And that could happen in 15 minutes after we get off the podcast. All right. But until that does, and you look at the cap situation, you look at other guys, they may or may not restructure. Uh, I think they're, I think it's still pl- somewhat plausible that they might trade Metcalf. Now, here's the thing when it comes to Metcalf specifically, when you look at his contract, there is absolutely no way in God's green earth minus 0.002%, just to, just to cover my butt, uh, that they trade him before June 1st. Because of the acceleration of the dead money, uh, look, if, if they trade him before June 1st, because of the cap acceleration, they clear all of $1.5 million in salary cap space. You're not going to go through all that rigmarole, not trading them before the 2024 draft and not getting draft capital and trading them after, uh, or before June 1st, after the draft to, to clear $1.5 million that I'm going to have to use the Chewbacca defense there. That would not make sense uh, to, to do that. However, comma, if they were to trade him after June 1st, when, you know, the, uh, the proration amount after 2024 does not accelerate into 2024 on dead money and instead gets pushed off to, uh, 2000 and, 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 and 25, uh, they would, they would free up 13 million in 2024 mm-hmm. salary cap space. So the, the, the more, the moral of the story here is, is if, They do not restructure DK Metcalf's contract here before June 1st. It's plausible that they could trade him on June June 2nd to a team and free up free up $13 million in 2024 salary cap space. Yeah, I mean, mathematically that makes sense. I just go back to why would teams do this? Why would teams hurt their own roster, hurt their own chances to win by trading away a valuable commodity and asset like DK. I think Seattle loves their, their top three of Lockett, uh, Metcalf and Smith and Jigba. And you're not getting anything that helps you now. 
and Mel, uh, Dr. Mel favorite, Jake Bobo. Um, tonight, yeah, they could still restructure Metcalf on June 2nd and just clear up his, his space that way if they wanted to. That seems a more sure. logical way to create cap space than trading away DK, get all the heat in the media for a first-year head coach and Mike McDonald that will come with trading away DK Metcalf to get back a third-round pick next year, whatever whatever the compensation would be. Right. I don't even want to get into the can of worms about the, the what the compensation would be. All right. Because someone say that's too high. That's too low. Okay, it would sure. take more than that. Okay. I'm just, I'm just exploring the overall plausibility of them dealing them. And you do, you do make, and uh, every that, that is a big sticking point of why wouldn't you just restructure his deal to free up the, Oh, what would they free up with him? Five point something million. And uh, you know, they could do him and that defensive tackle over there and get, I don't know, a little over nearly $11 million and freed up uh, salary cap uh, space that way there. Uh, in fact, let me give you exact numbers here. If they were to not add void years or anything onto uh, uh, DK Metcalf's deal as it stands right now, uh, they would free up. Hold on a minute here. Let me pull up the numbers with DK Metcalf. They would free up almost $6 million in salary cap space. Draymond Jones is another guy uh, that I I don't even know what his standing with the team. Is he a cut candidate of theirs? Or have you been following him close uh, enough I, to know who's on the in and not. the out uh, uh, with them? Uh, they could free up $4.9 million in, in, in salary cap space if they restructured him. I don't know where they sit with Julian Love as f- possibly being a, 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 a cut candidate right now. Look, you, there's we, we, we have said this several times. There's always ways to massage the cap, whether it be cuts, restructures, contract extensions, whatever, uh, to, to keep players that you want to keep. Sure. Now, you could argue that Mike McDonald, for whatever reason, just does not like DK Metcalf, doesn't see him as a fit in their system. It is a new head coach and largely new coaching staff, same GM in John Schneider, but that probably was more of a Pete Carroll pick. I think Pete was controlling the board and the draft more than John Schneider was. So that could be a reason why Metcalf would be on the move, because there is a new head coach, a new coaching staff, and for whatever reason, schematically, et cetera, there may not be a fit that would make some level of sense of why Seattle would have any sort of motivation to trade DK Metcalf in June. And let's face it, a uh, 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 receiving core of Jackson Smith and Jigba, uh, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, uh, Jake Bobo. That's, that's not bad, right? <laughs> that's a very solid group of weapons. Yeah. The tight ends they have as well. It's a good group. All Running right. backs, pretty talented. All right. But, what I'm getting at here is, is of all the names that's out there, at least that I can see that would be significant playmakers at the wide receiver posi- position that uh, an Odell Beckham. Uh, we have some news. Yeah. The Dolphins are expected to sign hmm. Odell Beckham Jr. So that's another wide receiver uh, off the board today. Not that, Not people that we had interest in. Not that people were clamoring to 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 sign Odell Beckham Jr., but that that's yet another name off of the potential list, right? Right. I mean, you've had a bunch of free agent receivers sign post draft, which is typical. Veterans start finding new homes past the compensatory period, and post draft, we've seen Michael Gallup go to the Raiders, DJ Chark to the Chargers, and now Odell Beckham Jr. to the Dolphins. Again, I was not clamoring for Odell Beckham Jr., but it was one of the names out there, and he's no longer out there. Now, look, I, you know, I don't want to go down where we're having five episodes again about a guy like, you know, like we talked about with uh, uh, Brandon Ayuk and all like that. But uh, at this point is and if you were to rule, does it seem like Court and Sut- Cortland Sutton's that that's not going to happen? I still think it's the most logical name. I okay. don't know what Denver's posture is. It seems to be we're not trading him. But every team's posture, as you've said, is we're not trading him until we're trading him. Uh, and he's in the final year too, right? Didn't we say? No, I think is... he has a year after, doesn't he? They yeah. assigned two years. He's got through 2025, I believe. Right, right. Wrote, right. Uh, yeah, and I suppose you could come up with a reason why maybe they, what are they looking, what are the Broncos looking at cap wise right now? I mean, they've got 9.9 million in cap space per the NFLPA sheet right now. 
So it's not like they're hurting. They might need a little bit more cap space before the start of the season. I suppose they could get into a situation post June 1st where in, instead of, uh, because if they, if, if, if Denver traded Cortland Sutton before June 1st, they would free up $9.7 million in salary cap space. If they waited until after June 1st, they would clear $14 million. Yeah, and I just say Sutton from the standpoint of we just saw Denver trade Jerry Judy for pennies on the dollar. Sutton seems to be unhappy in Denver for multiple reasons, potentially. Uh, Pittsburgh having Zach Azani on staff who coached Cortland Sutton. The contract's not unreasonable. The compensation would be, I think, you know, nothing crazy to give up wouldn't be Ayuk level. I don't know if that's going to happen again. I'm I'm all tuckered out of speculating, but that's a name that still makes makes sense to me at least logically. All right, let's start wrapping this conversation up here by saying this: of of what remains out there right now that would fit what the Steelers need, that would be at least a needle mover as far as an addition. I mean, a that short that that list is short, but. Is it plausible to at least still have Sutton and maybe a DK Metcalf on that list as a as a as a post June first? It's plausible, sure, but and I look, I know you get into maybe DK D, DK on top of it too. Once to, with all this wide receiver movement, maybe he's wanting to re up again. You know, and, sure, and and. and, and uh, you know, if a team like the Steelers were to trade for him, would they have to turn around and make him happy with a new contract? You know, sure. Or if not this year, then probably next year. Right, right. And look, if the Steelers did trade for a guy like DK Metcalf, they would have to. Uh, amazingly, he has the same base salary as Cortland Sutton does as thirteen million. Boy, that thirteen million dollar cash expenditure sure fits into the Steelers' cash budget from where I sit. Uh, in, 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 in mom's basement in Las Vegas right now uh, with both those guys. Now, in, in both circumstances with both Sutton and, and, and DK Metcalf, more than likely either as part of an extension or just getting them under contract, you'd have to get that cap number down and probably a restructure. If you didn't give them either one of them a new contract, you'd have to tur- turn around and probably restructure their contract to get their, 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 their cap number down. Mm-hmm. But I just realized that both uh, both of them have identical base salaries due in 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 in, in 2024. The Steelers obviously reached. Oh, by the way, the uh, Alex Highsmith uh, contract hit the uh, NFLPA. So uh, we had talked about that the other mm-hmm. day. So that that restructure's done. They have more than enough salary cap space to accommodate. You know, pretty much a trade for anybody at at at, 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 at this point. Yeah, they're financially, they can acquire whoever they want to acquire. According to Rappaport, Rappaport, by the way, Odell Beckham Jr., one-year deal worth up to $8.25 million. He took less than was offered elsewhere, but wanted the fit. We don't know who the other team offered was, but that is the report from Ian Rappaport. A, the Steelers aren't going to do, or, or at least haven't in some time, do up to deals with non, non-quarterbacks. So, Correct. That has not been their style. And any for for that much... We'll have to see what the base is and all like that. It, it just right. seems like that's that 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 was a that was a uh, play the Steelers weren't going to make on a one year deal. I would have given DJ Chark that one year, even the up to five million. I don't know the particular language. Sure. I would have done that. I that, I think that would have made sense. I think that was a good deal for DJ. To be honest with you, though, without seeing the particulars of what up to means, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah but he he was a. Dynamic last year on a bad Panthers offense. He averaged 15 yards per catch, had five touchdowns on 35 receptions. Is he going to be this amazing number two option? No, but I think he would have he would have checked the boxes of what you need. Now, if Pittsburgh makes a big swing and go gets a top tier to get guy, then good on them for it. I would have signed Chark. I would have been happy with that group overall. Chark, Pickens, and Roman Wilson in the slot. All right, to wrap up uh, DK Metcalf, it'd be fun. Uh, you know, I'm a cap nerd. I like to watch uh, teams work around cap situations. I'm going to now be watching the Seahawks situation uh, very close. Obviously, if they turn around here in the very near future and restructure the contract of DK Metcalf, you can forget about that at that point uh, there. But if they start kind of nickel and diamond this thing uh, on on into past signing their draft class and all like that, 
I think it's going to raise a few eyebrows here if they don't restructure his his contract uh, uh, right now. Do I think it, it you know this will ultimately happen with him? You know, I would lean obviously to to say no. I don't think it will. But consider the rabbit hole gone down now, and that at least to some degree there's a plausibility of it. Yeah, I get that. I just. Make a move or don't. At this point, I've heard about so many receiver names. I'm just ready for us to have an answer. Right. And once again, they, if they trade him at all, it won't be until June 2nd. Right. There, that, we can that, say for we, sure. We, we know that without a doubt, that, that they will not trade him until June 2nd. Right. That makes sense. All right. Any other thoughts here, Dave, on the DK rabbit hole you went down? No. Okay. We will move on now. Let's go to just quickly did a video breakdown on current Steelers receivers in Roman Wilson. And I mean, we know he's a good route runner. I just have a video with a couple of clips of his fluidity, change of direction, but also the, the same takeaway that you had as well, where it's a lot of free releases. It's a lot of in motion. Um, and again, he's going to have to kind of work on route running a bit more statically and in dealing with some press coverage at the NFL level. Right, he can separate, especially against uh, when, when when getting those free free releases. I like the way he catches the football. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he's got good mechanics that way. Uh, I think on even a few of the things that you showed where he was not throwing the football, he's he, he's he's running the routes properly. Uh, I think on the routes that he does run, he runs them effectively. Uh, it's just weird, you know. Uh, I, I kind of thought we'd find a little bit more contested catches in there in his tape. Uh, they're not there. And then once again, I, th I think you roll back. The, the, the biggest thing is, is, you know, how is he going? To, how how is his game against more kind of uh, press coverage uh, as, as he moves on into the NFL? Yeah, he's fluid. He's smooth. There's no slowdown in speed and adjusting to the football or catching the football. It's all done at the same time. Same speed, he's quick to the tuck, quick to getting upfield, all that's impressive. So just a couple of clips and a video breakdown on the site to demonstrate that. All right, Dave, last thing I have for you here today is rookie minicamp, which will again take place May 10th through May 12th. A couple new names known to that list. Uh, Pitt corner Marquise Williams will come in for a tryout. Villanova receiver Rajon Pringle will come in for a tryout as well. We already know probably about I don't know, a dozen or so names who will be coming in, probably another dozen that will get announced when the team releases their rookie minicamp schedule. So we'll see who, if anyone from the tryout circuit gets added to their 90-man roster. I guess one other thing we should highlight is what Omar Khan had to say about Be Beanie Bishop Jr. Yeah, I was excited to land him as an undrafted free agent, said there'll be a great chance for him to come in and compete. And so that I think is the most notable UDFA they signed him and probably John Rice Plumley. although I think Bishop certainly has a much cleaner and easier path given right now this vacancy uh, at slot. Uh, but this team also, I think you mentioned, they have, what, four open roster spots right now. So could that be for a tryout guy? Could that be for a veteran signing? They'll have to use it at some point, probably sooner than later, and, and get to their max of 90 because one of their UDFAs, 91. Yeah. yeah, Julius Welshop is uh, international. Uh, he's exempt from uh, counting against the roster. So that's why they get an extra spot open for, uh, for him because of him. So we'll see how they use it. Um, but again, I think this team needs to, to add some veterans at slot corner and at outside receiver. And I would imagine over the course of this next week, we'll be able to add to the uh, confirmed uh, tryout list there. Yeah, hope so. And again, the team usually will release their their tryout or the rookie minicamp roster a day or two ahead of time, and we'll pass it along whenever that becomes available. Am I reading too much into the whole DK Metcalf thing? Is that just Dave being Dave? A little bit, I think. I, I, at this point, I'm not going to say that there's no chance. I'm just trying to see beyond the financial aspect, what reason is there to believe that DK Metcalf would be on the trade block? Okay, fair enough. Okay, so we will we will keep an eye on it, though, and see what happens with him contractually right around June 1st. All right, Dave, anything else? If not, we can get to some reader emails and close out today's show. All right, let me pull up the email machine here and see what we have from the listeners. G has your Gmail been acting funny lately? Slow? I was having some difficulty loading it two days ago, yeah. Uh, I'm having problems with it. I mean, not loading, but it's it's mighty sluggish. All right, I, I got it loaded here. Patrick 
Shiner writes in, Hi guys, is it at all possible that Najee and his agent want to test free agency next year because of an understanding that Pittsburgh isn't going to pay him the money he feels he deserves and Pittsburgh is giving him that opportunity? Question mark. Najee is a large promoter of the running back payment movement. Also, maybe he wants to be more to uh, uh, more traditional bell cow instead of splitting carries and he feels the best option. And once again, Pittsburgh is giving him that opportunity rather than holding him hostage in a sense for another year. Year. Just seems so odd that they wouldn't pick up six point seven million for a player they speak of, of so highly. Love the pod. Keep up the great work, Patrick. First and foremost, let let let, let let's be clear here. Uh, Najee had no say in this. It's not like they could say, "Oh no, no, uh, uh, we have decided we don't want Pittsburgh to pick up the fifth year option." This was all the Steelers' decision on this, and he would have had to like it or not like them picking up his fifth year option on that. So, but as Alex stated earlier in our conversation, you know, if, if, if Najee was to try to look for a silver lining in the Steelers declining his fifth year option, it would be fantastic. I know what, I know they probably weren't going to pay me anyway. If I can stay healthy and I can, uh, uh, stay on the field, if I can at least produce at the level, if not better than I've done, in my first three years, I'm going to get paid next March. Right. Sooner the better running backs can get paid is probably their strategy overall. So that is the upside, but I'm sure he's still not, not loving the decision, but you're right, Dave, this was not a collective collaborative decision. This is a Steelers decision and Najee just has to play the hand he's dealt. All right, this one from Joe Mendoza writes in, Hello, gentlemen. Many thanks for your continuing great coverage of them Steelers. You guys are the best in the biz. They they just drafted uh, the just drafted rookie linemen hold a lot of promise. How long before they become comfortable with Pat Myers techniques, assuming they are different from their coaching to date? Muscle memory is critical, he writes, especially with guys who log thousands of college snaps. A related question. It's taken the line about half the season to gel the last couple of years. Do you guys think that's due to learning the technique? Is it the players? Was it uh, the OC who we shall not who shall not be named? Uh, what does that blame pie look like? Cheers, Joe. All right. Uh, You've written a lot about the Pat Pat Meyer uh, mm -hmm. uh, technique and coaching and all like that, so have at it. Yeah, I would say there's an adjustment. I think about James Daniels when he came in. He had a really miserable camp his first th time through Pittsburgh, but he got better throughout the season as he adjusted. Uh, Meyer, while well, he's not the only coach, I'm sure, to teach this, but he's very aggressive in his past sets. You never go backwards. You never give ground. You're either setting flat or Going forward, especially for the interior guys, the tackle sets can vary a little bit based on how the defense is structured, depending on do you have a three tech, do you have a one tech, uh, wide nine, those types of things. Uh, yeah, I, I would not be surprised if there was an adjustment initially for all these guys, Fautanu, for Frazier, for McCormick. I have to go back through the tape a little bit. I think Fautanu, he's, he's a, he feels very veteran in terms of he, he varies his pass sets. He uses some of the techniques that Pat Meyer will employ, the chase down. For example, against a wide nine, where you, you're going to really be aggressive and, and come at him and close that that space. You're not going to set 45. You're not going to set vertically. You're really attacking, uh, which is used in those situations. Uh, that's a set that, that Pat Meyer uses. So for Fautanu, it might be easier. I mean, the good thing is these are all seniors, right? Frazier, Fautanu, and McCormick. And so they're more veteran guys that have more experience, and they might be able to pick things up a little bit quicker than say a younger guy that isn't as refined overall, not work on his technique and honed his craft as much, but yeah, short answer. I think there'll be an adjustment for all these guys and we'll just have to see how things look. All right. Well done. Uh, let's hit this last one from Chris Warren. The off season is a time for dreaming big about the Steelers prospects in that vein. I thought I would mention that cam chancellor was six, three, 220 pounds, fifth round draft pick with 33 inch arms. The odds are that Ryan Watts is not going to turn into cam chancellor, but his size and combine measurables stack up quite nicely. Do you think that safety is likely the best position for Watts? And can you talk a bit about the advantages of having a guy with his size and measurables uh, down in the box? All right. Uh, one of the things that we keep going back to with Ryan Watts, I think that's amusing, was uh, with the Alex Kazora studies, 
uh, and in fact, you, you, you have an add on to that, uh, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, 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 the total guys that check boxes, throw that out there real quick. Yeah. And shout out to Clay Necker. Cause I always forget to check these things, but of the studies we did, there were only 14 prospects who checked every single box across the half dozen or so positions we looked at. And three of them became Steelers. Logan Lee checked every box. Mason McCormick checked every box and Ryan Watts checked every box. All three of their day three selections hit everything and or what they look for. Studying. It was only 14 names. It's not like we had 70 names and just naturally you're going to probably hit some because you have such a wide pool. It was a very narrow number of names. So I know over recent years, it's become more of a struggle to get guys to qualify for checking boxes. And, you know, I think had Raymond Wilson participate, he probably would check every single box and stuff like that. But I, I feel pretty good about that. There's still validity to our what they look for study because it showed a pretty clear line between that and Pittsburgh's picks in this draft class. All right. That still gets the gold star then. Still does. Uh, uh, there. And I think the other thing that's just so amusing about Ryan Watts is, 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 is that arm length, man. Yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> and we found longer arms for a DB. I didn't get a chance to research it. We found a I, DB who said longer. I, I haven't got arms. Yeah. One of us going to have to go down that rabbit hole. I think this weekend and all, and here's the other thing I, uh, in, in full disclosure, Chris, I have not watched, uh, I have not deep dived Ryan Watts just yet. Um, to, to, to say for sure, are we looking more at him, you know, are, are the Steelers, in other words, is he going to have to play safety in the NFL? Um, uh, I, I think it's, it's true. What have you seen from him? Have you gone down deeper on him yet? That's the last guy I need to go with a deep dive on. I actually was watching McCormick some too. I didn't get a chance to, I meant to make mention of kind of my thoughts on him. We can do that for, for Monday show. Um, yeah. Watts, the question was, would he have to go to safety? He was playing safety at the shrine bowl, which is kind of an indication the NFL generally right. is thinking he might have to move there. I think that maybe look at him at both and kind of just to see what he's proficient at, how comfortable he is at safety. I think he'll be used in a couple different spots in camp. Right. Uh, it, it it's going to be interesting. I think it's kind of yet to be determined, yet to be determined of, of what he is. But it, it it would feel like maybe more more towards the safety side overall. Uh, look, he's got to make he, his first his first uh, action here is to stay healthy, have a good off season here at whatever position, and show up on special teams. Uh, first and first and foremost, the position and all will come out in the wash uh, ultimately. And I have not watched enough of him just yet to have a solid kind of a, a, a pit. What I have seen on 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 him, yeah, I don't even want to go down there because I you watch you know you watch a highlight tape and you don't get a sense of a guy you know and and, right, that's, right. That's, and I probably watched about eight other clips other than that so I I, I got to go down that rabbit hole a little bit more with him I'll try to do that this weekend what is that website with with this with the web I'm trying to remember what that website was called mock draftable it's a mock draftable okay thank you I'm gonna look that up uh, probably won't get an answer for this show but that's probably a good way to kind of see arm length for I'll, I'm DPs. I'm going to hit the Google machine at the same time so what do you want to see comparisons uh, is any is there it can that be a resource to find arm length is there uh oh. he's in the 99 percent he's in the 99 percentile in arm length which is no surprise is there anybody that's even <laughs> matched or is longer than him that was what i want to know well he'd be in the 100 percentile otherwise right i guess i'm, I'm not even sure if i've seen the 100 percentile but yeah i think so uh so who who is who's matched him i guess is kind of the question there's some corners we can israel go through. Mo- uh, Muko Amu out of South Carolina in 2021 is his best comparison overall with the web. Isaiah Johnson out of Syracuse, he had, man, he only had 32 and 7 8 inch arms. Yeah, and the South Carolina guy was 34 inch arms, and so Watts has him by half an inch. We know Ro Torrance was, uh, he's 34 and 1 eighth, according to Mock Draftable, so that doesn't count. Or it's not there, I should say. Thirty-four uh, and a half, thirty-four and an eight for uh, Roe Torrance, who was in this class. Right. I'm just going down the list of names of comparable players, and I'm not seeing, not seeing one on here. Yeah, I mean, we. Uh, what was Lonnie Johnson? Thirty-two uh, and five not, eight, because he's on. Yeah. You start climbing. You start going down sure. this rabbit hole. 
Uh, Isaiah Oliver, what was he? No, 33 and a half. Uh, Cam Hart out of Notre Dame. 33. 33. Uh, what was Julius Prince? What was Julius? He was 34. 34. Yeah. He was like Porter. Uh, what about Patrick Sertain? 32 and a half. Yeah. I mean, uh, what was Justin Lane? Justin Lane had pretty long arms, didn't he? 33, I think it said. 33. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So. He's got some long damn arms. I'll tell yeah, you that. I think it's the point we're trying to get across here. Right. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think the main takeaway here is they like him long still. And uh, he he won't have any problem feeding himself during training camp. That's for sure there. So we'll, we'll go down that rabbit hole a little bit more. We'll look at the tape and start, you know, better, maybe better being able to answer Chris's uh, question there. All right, Dave. Anything else? I think that's got it. I think we're what an hour and a half in. That's the perfect time today. Who who knew that we would be talking about what we are? We talked about uh, Najee not getting his fifth year option picked up. We talked about Jalen Warren talking about Justin Fields maybe returning kickoffs. Uh, we talked about DK Metcalf as a potential trade candidate. What else do we hit on? Um. I mean, those were the big things. Obviously, the whole Bryant McFadden unraveling right. that that tweet, how how quickly that situation turned. I, I guess what I'm getting at is who knew we'd be talking about the, these particular topics when we ended the Wednesday show? <laughs> it's the beauty of the NFL. Uh, all right. Uh, we will be back on Monday. And you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter slash X at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button up right, navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, hit SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad free button uh, and uh, follow the directions that way. Hey, shout out to uh, Ross McCorkle and Joe Clark. Uh, They're doing a fantastic job uh, with their new podcast video cast, if you will, uh, The Depot Dive. Uh, the fifth episode of that new, new show uh, dropped yesterday there. Go over there and, and find that and check them out and and, and listen in. We're very proud of them and uh, trying to, of course, obviously uh, up their listenership and, and, and would appreciate, you know, if you got time to, uh, to go and take in uh, uh, that show as well, too. So until Monday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.